Scanlon from Leicester. Martha Abbott, treasurer of the Vermont Progressive Party and former treasurer of the Bernie Sanders Congressional Senate Campaign. Samantha Hurt, the environmental associate with Congress. Tony Ricks, League of Women Voters. Uh, Eleanor Spotswood from the Attorney General's Office. Connor Casey, Vermont Democratic Party. Betsy Ann Rask, Legislative Council. And our media star here is Rebecca German with Orca Media, right. And Dennis, if you would want to start with the committee. So I'm Representative Dennis Devereaux from Mount Holly, representing Ludlow, Mount Holly, and Shrewsbury. And sitting next to you will be? Uh, Representative Patty Lewis from Berlin and Northfield. Hi, Jim Harrison from Chittenden, Chittenden, Bendon, and Bridgewater. Did, did everyone else notice as he said hi, he looks up at the camera? <laughs> That was long over. Montgomery. Um, John Gannon from Wilmington representing Halifax, Whitingham, and Wilmington. Hey Rick, it's Warren Kitzmiller. And he from? Knows, he knows me. He well, knows me. other people in the room. Oh, okay. Not. I represent <laughs> Montpelier. Okay. And so who's sitting next to you would normally be? Tristan Tolino, but sitting next to me usually isn't there. That's right. <laughs> but Tristan Tolino from Brattleboro, who has leadership responsibilities elsewhere in the building. Never there. Somebody just came in the room. Uh, and just arrived through the door, Wilt Senning, elections director and secretary of state's office. Okay. And Rick Hubbard, who are you on the phone? Rick Hubbard, Vermont citizen. <laughs> from? South Burlington. Thank you. Okay. And, um, Paul Burns, number one up here. Thank well, you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Paul Burns. I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont Public Interest Research Group, or VPIRG. VPIRG was founded in 1972. We have about 50,000 members and supporters uh, all over the state. Um, and we have members in every single legislative district um, around the state, which um, we work hard for in the summer months as folks knock on doors um, from, uh, from one end of the state to the other. My organization has worked on a broad range of issues from consumer protection to environmental issues, uh, government reform, health care and the like uh, for the full four plus decades uh, since we've been around. Uh, we've had a particular focus on campaign finance and government reform issues so it is a pleasure to uh, be invited here today to provide some comments on S120. VPIRG supports S120, uh, which of course would uh, restrict campaign contributions to candidates and political parties to only those coming from individuals, meaning a human being, as you know, a political party or a political action committee or PAC. The significant practical effect of this uh, is that it would prohibit corporations from making contributions to candidates and political parties in the future in Vermont. I want to point out that this is a concept that is uh, very popular among our members and I believe with the broader public, certain polling has shown this. When we invited some of our members and supporters to weigh in on this issue, uh, we offered the opportunity for them to sign on to the following uh, petition language. Quote, I am concerned about the corrosive uh, influence of corporate money on Vermont's political process and I support S120, a ban on corporate campaign contributions. Corporate campaign contributions have been illegal at the federal level for over 100 years and at least 22 other states have prohibited this practice. I urge you to support a ban on corporate contributions and help Vermont pass this long overdue measure. Uh, Madam Chair, you have a copy of this petition. There are about 800 or, or so signatures on this and um, I will make this available to all members of the committee here if you're uh, interested in flipping through. I do have a couple of uh, copies representative. I will just hand them uh, around. Uh, and also for committee, I have my set here. Thank you. And so say, I'll send this electronically as well in order to try to save uh, some paper. Warren, you had a question? 
Yeah, I, I suspect you know much more than I do about the difficulty of setting up a pack. Is that a relatively easy process or an onerous and difficult project? Um, it's, uh, I, I don't, I guess it depends on how uh, familiar you are, how interested you are in this kind of uh, paperwork and filings and so forth. It's not impossible to do, but it is a burden. Um, and so the question comes, I suppose, whether corporations would easily decide to set up a political action committee as a means of giving. Or 10, uh, or 10 uh, as the case may be. Um, it's possible. I wouldn't consider it an easy thing for them to do. And um, I, it, it wouldn't be my expectation that that would be a remedy that, that many corporations would avail themselves of, um, no. at least in multiple numbers. No. Uh, of course, we will talk uh, a little bit later about the multiple corporations that a single wealthy individual can set up as well. And that is, that's a problem with the current system, uh, too. Uh, the Secretary of State's office could, provi could probably provide more specific information. Okay, uh, that's, that's my concern, obviously, is you yeah. know, it would be how, how easy is this <laughs> to circumvent. Yeah. Um, uh, I mentioned in the petition language itself that this is not a new idea. Vermont would be breaking no new ground um, in prohibiting corporate contributions. So again, the federal government has done it for over 100 years. 22 other states um, have completely prohibited corporations from giving to political campaigns. Another six, Alabama, Missouri, Nebraska, Oregon, Utah, and Virginia, allow corporations to contribute an unlimited amount of money to state campaigns. Of the remaining 22 states, 19 impose the same restrictions on corporate contributions as they do on individual contributions, and the other three set varying limits between corporations and individuals. Um, as you know, Vermont treats corporations as individuals in this respect, in the, in the manner in which we regulate their contributions to candidates. Um, in this way, then, we are out of step with the federal government and with many other states around the country. VPIRG is in agreement with President Teddy Roosevelt on corporate contributions. In his 1905 annual address to Congress, these were the words of President Roosevelt on the subject. Quote, all contributions by corporations to any political committee or any political purpose should be forbidden by law. Directors should not be permitted to use stockholders' money for such purposes. And moreover, a prohibition of this kind would be, as far as it went, an effective method of stopping the evils aimed at corporate practices at acts. Not only should both the national and several state legislatures forbid any officer of a corporation from using the money of the corporation in or about any election, but they should also forbid any such use of money in connection with any legislation, save the employment of counsel in a public manner in distinctly legal services, for distinctly legal services. So yes, things have changed in the last 100 years or so. In some respects, they haven't changed so much. This was the time of the robber barons, as we all know, a tremendous uh, consolidation of power in corporate entities. Uh, and, and President Roosevelt was uh, a genuine champion uh, when it came to trying to break up the consolidation of that power in the hands of a relatively few uh, entities. Um, that call for action against corporate contributions and corporate influence in elections was one of those things that did lead to the prohibition on corporate contributions at the federal level uh, relatively shortly thereafter. Corporations enjoy certain uh, advantages over us human beings. Um, unlimited life and limited liability are a couple of those advantages that corporations have because they have been given those advantages as a legal matter, as a matter of public policy. But those um, benefits, those corporate benefits were given to these legal entities in order to make our economy flourish, to help our marketplace develop, um, they were not given to corporations so that the corporations could amass great wealth in their corporate treasuries and then use that money to influence the political process. So that's something that, that many folks have recognized over a long time. It's not, we're not anti-corporation. I'm not anti-capitalism. I'm pleased to see businesses flourish in this state and in this country. There's a question about how they use those resources and how they use the advantages that we as a, as a society grant them in order that they might um, uh, operate more effectively than we can as private individuals. 
Um, again, that's the reason why we have corporations, is to run businesses um, and to, to help that marketplace flourish. Um, admittedly, uh, the, it's not just corporate money uh, that causes a problem in our political process. You know, big money, we would argue, is a problem across the board. Uh, certainly, there is a problem of wealthy individuals um, having tremendous influence over our elections um, at the federal level, that's easy to see, and it is, by the way, true across the political spectrum. This is not just a conservative problem or a liberal problem. There are people of, of great wealth who use that to influence elections, no question about it. Um, we are, however, limited by the Supreme Court in what we can do to address some of these challenges. Uh, I, I know you've all talked some about that already, but the world is not our oyster um, when it comes to being able to make changes or restrictions on the influence of uh, money in the political process. That is, the court has said pretty clearly, here are areas that you are free to go, here are areas that you may not go. There are some other areas where you can go, but only at the highest level of, um, with evidence to, to demonstrate a compelling state interest, for instance. Um, so, you know, we can put limits on what um, uh, persons give to candidates for office because there is a danger that our process will be corrupted if uh, a single person, that being an individual or a corporation or other entity, gives too much money to a candidate for office, and they may get something in return. And as you know, that's a type of quid pro quo corruption, this for that. Um, and in the past, Vermont has tried to address uh, in a pretty aggressive way that type of uh, political corruption that comes with large donations. We've also tried to address just the issue of, corp of uh, candidate spending. And of course, the law passed by Vermont in 1997 to put the nation's lowest limits on contributions uh, and put actual limits on what candidates could spend went all the way up to the Supreme Court. After nine years, in the year 2006, it was argued in front of the Roberts Supreme Court. I was fortunate enough to be there at the Supreme Court as that argument was made. My organization had been so involved in the process that our attorney got 10 minutes of that argument, and Attorney General Sorrell got 20 minutes of the time in front of the Supreme Court justices there. It's a fascinating thing. If you've never taken the opportunity to go to the U.S. Supreme Court, regardless of the case, I, I recommend it. Um, it's you know, that's our democracy uh, in action, and it's, it was really neat. I wish the turnout had been a little bit better uh, in terms of the way the case went, but, um, uh, but it was still a fascinating, a fascinating thing to see. And uh, the court at that time made pretty clear that we are not, um, absent some pretty significant shift in the makeup of the court, going to see uh, limits on what candidates can spend in elections. Um, but the court did allow for contribution limits, um, and it also allowed for uh, much more by way of disclosure. Um, the court has allowed public financing systems and other systems to encourage small donations to candidates, um, and the court has never um, decided that it is improper, illegal, or unconstitutional uh, to place a ban or other restrictions on what corporations can give to individuals. So this is not to be clear, this is not a legal problem before you today um, with respect to, the, to this bill, S-120. So does money actually have a corrupting influence in the political process? Um, I would ask you to consider a recent study done by the Roosevelt Institute, which identified a series of high-profile cases in which political contributions influenced members of Congress on key floor votes involving financial reform. Um, in the September 2017 uh, publication, In These Times, they went on to describe the influence of big money uh, in the process of uh, where the U.S. House of Representatives considered the Dodd-Frank financial reform bill. They isolated specific representatives who initially voted in favor of the bill and subsequently voted to dismantle some of its key provisions. What they found was a direct link between the voting behavior and the campaign contributions from the financial sector. According to the paper, for every $100,000 that Democratic representatives received from the finance industry, the odds that they would break with their party's majority uh, support for Dodd-Frank le legislation increased by 14 percent, roughly. Democratic representatives who voted in favor of finance often received two to $300,000 from that sector, 
uh, which raised the odds of switching by 20 to 40 percent. So the point there is that if the financial sector was giving large contributions to uh, members of Congress, in this case Democratic Democrats uh, in Congress, their support for Dodd-Frank uh, financial reform legislation evaporated. Uh, it's this kind of study and analysis that helps to explain the influence of money on the political process. And I've got the article that I will share with you uh, as well that describes this in greater detail. Uh, uh, yes? Paul, uh, Jim has a question on that. Sorry. Um, well, do you have any um, evidence that um, this has uh, corporate contributions or um, nonprofit contributions have caused corruption at the state level here in Vermont? It's difficult to make the link, Representative. Um, in the time that we were uh, arguing for and defending the law that was passed in Vermont, there were specific examples given uh, by then the pro tem of the Senate, for instance, as they considered regulation of uh, food uh, products and, and use of uh, pesticides, etc. And uh, there were suggestions that industry contributions at that time had an influence on the activities of the Senate. And and what issues can't rise to um, the, the level of priority uh, so that they would be taken up by certain committees, for instance. So we didn't, we didn't win that case. You know, the Supreme Court, uh, I, I will add, was not persuaded um, by this. I, I grant that that is true, but the Supreme Court's definition of corruption has evolved fairly significantly in recent years, even since that law was passed, so that now it's, it's it's much closer to, I received a contribution almost in exchange for a vote on an issue. I don't think that, I don't have any evidence that that happens in Vermont. It is my great hope that that doesn't happen ever here. I think what is more likely is that we, um, we would see a, a level of influence that might come with a contribution. Governor Dean mentioned in his State of the State address in 1997 and I don't have the exact quote for you, but to paraphrase, he suggested that uh, he is one who absolutely returned calls more rapidly to individuals who had given him a contribution. Uh, it wasn't that he would never get back to somebody who didn't. It wasn't as though he would disregard their concerns. But what he suggested was that there's something did come from uh, the, the giving of money to a candidate. And I guess I would argue, and we're seeing this now outside the political context, but in the cases of, of medical doctors, uh, what, they, what medicines and prescription drugs they provide or prescribe, uh, there was a study just in the last few weeks released that suggested that doctors are much more likely to prescribe medications if they have gone on a junket or been given other uh, gifts and meals and so forth by the maker of that pharmaceutical. Did one thing follow the other? It's a little bit hard to know. Uh, in other words, if you're somebody who represents a certain interest, it's not unreasonable that the corporation might give you money because they like what you stand for. What came first is always going to be difficult to tell, but there are these studies that show a kind of link. I guess I would argue that if you're in line at the cafeteria and the person ahead of you turns around and says, I, I got your lunch today, no problem, uh, just as a matter of convenience and friendliness, your natural human inclination will be to pick up lunch for them the next day, uh, I would guess because you're a good and generous uh, person, Representative. Um, that's not corrupt. Don't make too many <laughs> <laughs> I would argue that it, if, if one were to have that feeling, it would not be corrupt. It is, it's kind of human nature that you want to do something in return for a person who does something for you. In the political process, it becomes corrupt because we have this system of private financing and of course people are going to give you money it is only reasonable that you would want to give them something in return, even if that something is a return, a prompt return phone call or a little bit more time in the cafeteria when they come to visit you at the state house. So I think that's probably but, more. But isn't that true whether it's an individual or whether it's a small business or uh, another corporation? It is. I mean, I'm I looking at your list and there's a constituent of mine on that list that um, I think has been known to contribute to campaigns. Now, uh, if she were to contribute to my campaign, am I now um, influenced by that contribution? Possibly. Possibly. Um, uh, so uh, in, in which case, uh, whether it's individual or corporate, aren't we in the same dilemma? Um, maybe we should have public financing where it's removed totally. 
even with public financing, you would not remove the possibility of individual contributions because our courts wouldn't allow you to set up a system that prevented individuals from being able to give to candidates. Our laws do allow for the prevention of corporate contributions to candidates, for, however, and what I've been arguing is that there is actual a, a difference, a legal difference, and an important um, uh, public policy difference between corporate money going to candidates because of the way corporations amass great wealth in their treasuries shouldn't be able to use that money. They are different than living and breathing human beings. I guess I would argue as well that under our current system, and this was a response to Representative Kitzmiller earlier, the, the current system allows for a workaround to the limits that the current Vermont law places on contribution limits. So a very wealthy individual today can, and in some cases we have seen this, they have multiple corporate entities, uh, limited liability companies, for instance, and each one of those LLCs can max out in their contributions. So a single individual could give you $1,000. Uh, Ten more LLCs that are created by that individual could also give a total of $10,000, therefore circumventing the laws that we have in, pace, in place to limit the influence of any one entity, whether that is a wealthy person, a corporation, or anything else. And so there are a number of reasons why I think this step makes sense, but it's not, it is not the complete and only answer to the, to the challenges we face that are posed by money in the political process. We do happen to support public financing as another means to go here, uh, but that doesn't mean you don't take advantage of the opportunities that we have to do something to reduce the problem as well. reduces transparency. So I'm looking at, you know, Joe Smith, who's running the lieutenant governor, and I look at his list, and it's PACs, but really it's corporations. So in some ways, I'd rather know what corporation it is that's giving and how much they're giving, rather than have it filtered so that we've got a um, harder time of understanding what, what is really happening. What's behind um, who's really giving to this candidate? So then I can make an educated decision about whether or not I want to vote for that person. So that's my concern. And I understand that that's a hard one because the courts have said PACs are OK. And honestly, myself, I think PACs are probably, if not as bad, at pretty close um, to what corporations can do in campaigns. So I'm curious about how you respond to that. Mm. Well, and then there are, of course, different kinds of PACs, uh, right? So there are the independent expenditure PACs, or otherwise known as super PACs, and, and PACs where there is coordination with candidates or contributions to candidates. The, the latter PACs have been more traditional uh, uh, political action committees. And there you, you do have to have disclosure about who's giving to those PACs. It's, it's really not, a, it's not difficult to find out who's giving money to those PACs. There and there are two steps. Uh, yes, uh, that's true, but very few voters are spending an awful lot of time looking at the campaign contributors to um, candidates. It's something my organization does, it's something the media occasionally does, but I, I have to say it's not that easy for anybody to, to figure that out. It's not, um, you don't wear the, the, the badge that says, you know, brought to you by. Um, and so, and you know. That's wonderful, and uh, I, my guess is if you asked, you know, 100 people, you wouldn't find a, a great number who are spending time on the Secretary of State's website. Uh, I, I, <laughs> you say you are? No, I'd say that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to be uh, amazed. Um, and that's not, I'm not happy about that. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to make it, and they, they've actually done a good job. I mean, they're making it better all the time and, and as easy as, as, as one could reasonably expect. But I think that's a challenge. Um, 
But those PACs, you're right, there's nothing that we can, we can do about that. But there are those limits in place, both on contributions to those uh, political action committees. There are challenges. I mean, I don't think it's likely that everybody who receives a contribution from a corporation now will receive that same amount of money when the corporation sets up its own PAC, for instance, or decides to, to give to other political action committees who are giving to a candidate. There's just not that much PAC activity now. And I, I don't believe that this is a situation where you're simply going to see the balloon squeezed and, you know, uh, right, it goes someplace else. Some of it, some of it may. But I think we, you might argue that we better not place any limits or any further limits on what anybody can give to a candidate because of that same concern. And I think that begins to get close to throwing up our hands and saying there's really nothing we can do about campaign finance reform or, the, or reasonable limits on contributions out of fear that it might go someplace worse someplace darker and less, you know, more difficult to track. Okay. I'm, I get nervous about unintended consequences. There's a lot of things we do. So well, we have to be aware of that. We, as I say, this is not a new idea. There are many states that have this operating now and the federal government. And we wouldn't say that they are perfect systems. But I would ask that, encourage you to take this step and pledge that next year we're going to come back and take a serious look at there is public financing. We wouldn't be breaking new ground there either, but there are systems out there that are doing a good job of providing an alternative for candidates who, who don't want to spend all the time on the phone raising you know, private donations and so forth. Uh, Maine, Arizona, Connecticut are some states that have done a good job of creating those programs. Now uh, there are more and more municipalities and others uh, who are setting up different systems to encourage small donor contributions as well. Those deserve uh, to be looked at. But, but there really is, there no, if there were um, terrible unintended consequences that would likely result from that, I think we would see evidence of that in the other states uh, that have this already. That's not what we're seeing elsewhere. <laughs> I appreciate that, <laughs> Madam Chair. Away. And I, I, I do want to give you a heads up, since you have mentioned the, the various other states. Um, one of the things I'm hoping you might be able to help us with, if not today, mm -hmm. you know, as, as we go on through the week, when the Deputy Secretary of State was in um, last Friday, um, he did. Um, encourage us to look at what other other states are doing to stay away from um, the uh, the possibility of multiple PACs being formed and that sort of thing. Um, and figuring, you probably have it almost memorized. What's in statute? At least an overview for these 22 other states. If you can point us toward this, that, or the next state that might be good, because this this committee is not a stranger to. Um, amending bills that come to us, trying to make them tighter and more more likely to deliver what the intent really is, mm -hmm. which is to, you know, in this instance, to control how money's flowing. Thank you. Uh, and and I don't have them memorized, but the National Conference of State Legislators has, you know, good information on this. That would be my first place well, to, to go. Well, we, we've been, we've been there. <laughs> we of the 22, as opposed to, you know, yeah. trying to plow through 22, we thought you might have some highlights. Uh, John? Um, well, I, I agree with Jessica. I am concerned about the unintended consequences of the bill, especially with respect to PACs. Uh, and I do think we can address that um, through disclosure um, in this bill. Um, and I think, you know, we need, if we're, we're going to pursue this bill, it needs to be a strong bill. Um, just banning direct corporate contributions only goes part way in solving this problem. Um, so, I mean, following up on Maida's question, what states have done more than that, that have gone into disclosure? Because disclosure is really the only area that's left because, because of the Supreme Court decisions. Uh, disclosure and moving into the area of incentives for uh, 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 raising the money that you need outside of the system, right. um, which is which is important as well. I mean, I consider that a, a big area and lots of opportunity there that is fully legal has been you know vetted um, in that respect. There uh, have uh, there, the court, the Supreme Court even has given a pretty open door to different kinds of disclosure provisions. 
um, even as they have struck down more restrictive measures. Uh, that's a pretty strong indication that that's, you know, that that, that is open to you. Um, I, I just, uh, so I, I guess I'd be interested to know what, you know, what direction that you might be heading. If we were to put a prohibition on corporate contributions and related types of contributions, unions, et cetera, are obviously covered by this. Um, what kind of disclosure would we be looking for? I gather that you're talking about political action committees and what kind of disclosure might be possible there. Um, I, I would have to look more fully into it, Representative, to, to respond uh, well, effectively. I was just wondering if you were aware of any disclosure concepts that are out there in other states that, that address this issue. Because, I mean, that's the next step be, be beyond just banning direct corporate contributions um, to, to individual yeah. It is useful to know. So uh, that that the money that corporations can use for political action committees, they set up their own political action committee as well. Um, it's not limited to a disclosure provision, but they can't use the general treasury dollars for that. That is money that has to come from officers and um, officials, employees of the corporation itself. That's also an important distinction when we think about PACs, PAC money versus direct corporate contributions today is, in my opinion, the general treasury dollars are the ones that are more problematic. Because if you require a corporation to give through a PAC, at least it's human beings who are making their contributions known through that way. And that's a, that's a better process. That does not apply to the super PAC um, uh, situations. The super PACs, in terms of disclosure or virtually any other regulation, I, uh, I'm not sure that I know of anything that is both creative and legal. <laughs> You can go one way or the other well, there, I think. Regular packs that I think we need to focus yes, and I think you could do uh, potentially more there on the, the regular packs, although, again, we've got some, some pretty good disclosure provisions now. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Betsy. So, Betsy Andrasco, Legislative Council, just to follow up on two things that I'm hearing the committee discuss. Um, one, um, I'll provide this to you in a handout, but under federal law, Corporations and labor unions are required to form what's called a separate segregated fund pack because under federal law, corporations and labor unions are not allowed to make direct contributions, but they're allowed to set up these separate segregated funds. And under federal law, one of the requirements for that separate segregated fund, and I'll provide the site, it's 52 USC uh, 30102. Uh, D, or excuse me, E5. Um, it requires that separate, separate segregated fund um, to include in its name the name of its connected organization. So, for example, Corporation X wants to set up one of these funds, it has to include Corporation X's name. Um, I'll also, provide to you, Representative Bromstead, in regard to one of your other questions. Um, there is, I'm aware of, one Connecticut law. Um, I'll provide a link to it for you um, that prohibits any business entities from establishing more than one PAC. You had asked that question yeah. earlier. Yeah. Can, yeah. I, can I ask Betsy any questions? Sure. Um, do, do our campaign finance laws currently ban um, corporations who are doing business with the state from contrib contributing to campaigns? Well, you just last year in the ethics bill established that pay Disclosure. play prohibition yeah. where sole source contractors are prohibited source, from, uh, yes, making contributions to the office with which they're contracting. What's that? Only that office. That office, yep, yeah, that, that candidate, um, the office, the candidate for that office. Um, there's also a prohibition in the treasurer statute that pro prohibits investment services, uh, investment fund services, businesses, um, from giving contributions to the treasurer. And I'll also provide a link to you to that law. That's 32 BSA 109, I think. Thank you. Thank you. That's you. You all set? Yeah, thanks. Okay. thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So there, so there are, you know, things that could be done there. Um, I particularly like the one that with the corporate corporate name would have to be, you know, in uh, associated with the, the pack itself. So you can't avoid that. You know, you can't be the people for puppies and rainbows. You know. Um, Clean water. Yeah. Owned by Oil or something. Right. 
Right. So, so. Energy out of algae these days. You saw it on So I. Yes. Oh, sorry. Just to go back a little bit, you said that currently PACs have to list the officers of the corporation or members. That's the and, and that's the M8. I don't know if you have the specific. This was the um, the separate segregated fund uh, uh, that that Betsy Ann was referring to. That can only receive money from uh, certain individuals at the corporation. So it's not corporate treasury dollars that can go into the separate segregated fund. If I if I am, have this right, they can only solicit certain people. I I don't think they're unlimited in who they can accept them from, but I'll have to double check that. So, so that, that's something that we, that we can look into, but it's not, it's not as though ExxonMobil can s simply say, I'm going to go into my $40 billion treasury here and, and make unlimited you know, contributions out of that for the PACs. That's the separate segregated fund aspect of this. This is why unions are always a bit different, because all of the union dollars come from individuals. They have a separate segregated fund, but it is, by its nature, different from a corporate, a for-profit corporate entity. Um, by the way, this applies to nonprofits as well, of course. But, yes? Yeah, I made me think of a question. So it's sort of like um, what they're asking for then is similar to if you donate to United Way through your corporation, you know, through the work, they would be able to donate to the, um, to the PAC. Would that be, or could they still, that the corporation runs, or does it have to, in other words, they can't take money out of their profits, is what you're saying, and put it into the PAC. They have to take money that is the money of the employees. Well, the, the employee, they, you know, the employees have to give, or the shareholders and so forth. Uh, for this. If it, and we should, we should look into this for, for clarity, and I believe this is federal law that we're talking about now. Um, and so rather than say anything that may be in any way inaccurate here, I think this is an area that is worth looking into because there clearly are restrictions in place that get at what is essentially the, the problem or the, the challenge here, that the corporations just be able to, to dip into that, that giant, in some cases, giant treasury of dollars to influence the political process seems totally inappropriate. And this is... I admittedly quite different from many of the corporations that give to candidates. If any of you have received corporate donations here, it might be a much more on the order of the mom and pop kind of situation here. We must uh, recognize that that's true. So there's not such a big difference between corporate treasuries or not. But in those cases, it's still a situation where that corporation, even mom and pop corporation could give to you and the individuals themselves could give to you and that too would be a way to circumvent the current restrictions in law. That too is a genuine problem that it seems like it is worth doing something about. That's what this legislation would do. And so if you could, so somebody in the room might have been yourself mentioned the labor unions. What's the impact of this bill as written on labor unions? They would be restricted in the same way that corporations would be from making direct contributions. However, labor unions are set up in a different way. Currently, they typically they are giving PAC through PACs. Right? So, so in practical effect, I don't think there would be, any, in my understanding, is any meaningful difference or any difference at all, perhaps, for the corporations, just because of the way that they are already set up to receive and give money in the political process. For corporations, it would be, in effect, a difference for them. And for the nonprofit corporations out there, who may have been, um, uh, who, uh, or which, may have been making contributions to whomever. Um, under the way this bill, within the way this bill is written, um, they would be able to continue to do so if they set up a path that uh, had in its it's only at the federal level that we have to say, uh, Joe's good for the world PAC. <laughs> well, you could, so they would have to give through a PAC if they wanted to make political uh -huh. contributions. That is, that is accurate. So okay. clearly under this law it says if you're not a human being or a political party or a political action committee, thou shalt not give. And that was the framing of it that I think made, made a lot of sense that the, that the Senate chose to go with instead of trying to name all of the entities that cannot give. They just named the, th the three that can. And so is it federal only currently, or is it both federal and state that a PAC has to have in its name? That's uh, federal. Somewhere. I believe that's federal, federal law only. Federal only. So this would and be... that's not spoken to in this bill as... 
it no. has a potential. It's not. And so to, to represent Gannon's point, there are opportunities to strengthen this proposal as well. The, the merits of the restriction itself, it's not a long bill. It's not a complicated bill. It's a question of whether you want to do it or not. It's been done elsewhere and so forth. But could you improve it further to get at what are potentially some of the unintended consequences? Uh, we certainly wouldn't oppose that um, and be happy to try to work with you. Thank you. Thank you. Just like Cindy and Jim, yeah. <coughs> I have looked at the reporting of candidates. And it's, it's pretty amazing. There's like ABC Corp and, you know, you have to go searching around to figure out who they are. And there's, it's actually surprising how many you will find for a candidate. Yep. And a lot of money. Could be 75% of their donations are from. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yes. Just pick a candidate. And, and you, you really should do that. Well, if we're talking about this, you need to yes. look around. And, and you'll see very quickly. You can look at the governor or you can look at a senator or look at our own folks. But there's a lot going on. It's worth noting that the a number of years ago, maybe six or eight years ago, we looked at the average cost of a competitive house race, and it was five or six thousand dollars at that time. I don't know if the same holds true today. A lot of races cost less than that because there's no candidate, no a challenger, for instance. But we're talking about competitive races, and what does it cost to run and win those races? Even at that, uh, it's a relatively small amount of money, we'd have to say, for the House races. The Senate races, of course, cost more. And the governor's race, the cost you know, is much higher, particularly for open seat elections. In this last election, it's worth reminding ourselves that the Democratic candidate, Sue Minter, uh, the nominee, did not uh, uh, raise any corporate contributions. And, and as, a, as a matter of kind of policy said, I'm not going to, to go there. I don't think anybody would argue that she was uh, unable to raise uh, dollars to run an effective campaign there. She obviously didn't prevail, but I haven't heard any analysis that suggested that that was the main problem for her, is that she didn't have corporate dollars. On the other hand, the governor raised uh, in the neighborhood of $500,000 from uh, corporate contributors. I'm sure that aided his um, efforts, and I, I recognize that he would have to go elsewhere if he wanted to raise the same amount of money. But as I said, Vermonters, and certainly my organization, believes that's a good thing, that you should raise whatever money that you're going to raise uh, as, uh, from, from individuals um, as much as we possibly can. Jim? So, Paul, uh, my understanding is this bill limits uh, applies to nonprofit corporations as well. So, recently, a nonprofit in my district um, offered me, uh, which I don't know that I need uh, the use of their meeting room to hold a meeting. Um, would that be prohibited under this? Could yes. Could be an in-kind? Okay. Um, so um, last fall, I'm a new legislator, as you know. Um, I want to serve my communities. I went to each community. Um, three of the four towns have transfer station, so I um, did uh, Dunkin' Donuts. Um, I gave out donuts, and um, I wanted to meet people and find out what their issues and concerns, uh, several of which uh, ended up in me sponsoring bills to get at some of those concerns. Um, but arguably, um, you know, there's some PR benefit for me, um, and come this all are probably doing the same thing, but now it will be with an eye towards getting elected. Um, that's that's town, typically town-owned land, which is town's a nonprofit. Um, is that prohibited? Uh, I um, I say first, I'm not providing legal advice uh, to you as I uh, <laughs> sit here, representative. So I encourage you. There are others in the room who uh, may want to engage on that. But I would say that there's no cost incurred. You know, this is not a space that anybody's renting out or foregoing because you're there talking to others. So it's a it's, it's a public uh, uh, place in that respect, uh, particularly as it is owned by the people. Um, I can't imagine that that would be a, a problem for you. I encourage you to go and, and do that. It seems like a great way to, to meet people and uh, discuss issues. I mean, that is, that is of course, what you, you would like to see uh, candidates right. doing. You know, that's 
exhibit gold star uh, represented, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what he's going for. <laughs> I, I am. Um, I, I think I would pretty much end there. I have some other materials. Um, some of them are interesting. They go to the very history of corporate personhood in this uh, country. That you, I don't know if your committee has discussed, but the history of the Fourteenth Amendment and how um, that was, uh, how we came to use the Fourteenth Amendment to defend the rights of corporations as. Persons um, and how um, that was a corruption of the intent of the drafters of the 14th Amendment. It's just an interesting article that you might want to, to take on that. The damage at this point arguably is done. Corporations are in many, many ways considered people and given the same rights as people. Uh, to put a fine point on it, we do not believe corporations are people and we do not believe they deserve the rights that we have as living, breathing human beings. Um, they are important entities, they have a role in our society, but that role should not be to provide an outsized influence over our political campaigns. So the degree that you could move forward with this bill, even as we find, as you all try to find ways to improve it, I think is wonderful. And then I appreciate the commitment to seeing what else, what else we can do uh, to the larger issue for, uh, to address money in politics. We will be there, um, as we have been here on this issue for many years now. Um, I, I just want to say, you know, do what we can. Uh, let's not throw up our hands. Please move forward with this bill. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Any other questions? Yes, Dennis. So, Paul, uh, five, six years ago, uh, it came, we discovered that our contribution rates were too low. And we visited that, and we raised the rates a little bit, and there was no disagreement, but we, we got there on it. So, uh, one of the main things that came out of that was there was a lot of agreement about, well, you know, I don't care where the money comes from as long as there's reporting. Uh, I give Vermonters a lot of credit and nationally, for the, I try to anyway, that when they know where the money came from, when somebody gave somebody a lot of money in this state, uh, it d didn't help that person one bit in the election because people knew where it came from. So I give the voters in this, this, this state, especially, credit that they, all they want to know is where it came from. So if they know who it came from, they can decide for themselves uh, whether they support this person still or not. But uh, expanding on uh, Representative Harrison, uh, the in-kind, this affects in-kind tr contributions. So I, uh, a local businessman can't even loan me a tent for a, a uh, an event, and uh, I, that's not the direction I want to go. As long as I report that that's a like a, a valued at a hundred dollars, the rental of the ten or something, uh, I certainly want to, uh, you know, maybe some of the language works. But uh, this in local in kind stuff is, uh, I'm not ready to go there. Uh, I understand that. I respect that. I think um, if. Raising the hundred dollars in even small contributions from a number of your supporters out there and then giving that business to your local tent company would be an even better idea. Um, you know, let's pay for those things that, that you might get in kind and then help your, your constituents who happen to own businesses too. Uh, that's another way to think about this is that I know your job is not easy. Um, I, and I, I haven't run for office, but my father was uh, in an elective office in New York State for 22 years, 11 years as a Republican, 11 years as a Democrat, uh, just so you, so you know. <laughs> uh, and and I, I have deep respect. I have respect for all of you, and, and frankly, anybody who puts themselves up for election. It is not an easy thing. Uh, it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to you know, put yourself out uh, in that way, to raise the money that you need to, and so forth. But I think. If you decide to do that, to ask you to raise your money from real people um, is not unreasonable. And, and disclosure, uh, with respect, I, we, I believe in disclosure as much as possible, but disclosure is not the same thing as putting actual limits on uh, the capacity of very wealthy individuals and corporations to, to gain influence. I, I don't believe that the system of disclosure only does work very well, because I don't think we have perfect disclosure. I don't think most voters have uh, a very good sense of where the money comes from that funds the candidates that they're voting for. I think that's just the unfortunate reality. Any other questions for Paul? 
Just yeah. one quick question. I just want to make sure I heard your testimony right. You said that S120 mm -hmm. won't have any impact on unions because unions already have PACs. Yes, it, 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 the way that they give in Vermont is, is essentially through a PAC now. Well, why wouldn't corporations do the same thing? I, I mean, the, uh, the, that's the way that unions raise their money is from human beings in small contributions. Corp that's not the way corporations raise their money today. So it is a much bigger challenge for them. There is a much greater disadvantage for corporations to set up PACs as their sole means of giving money than, than for unions. And it goes to how unions raise their money. Unions are made up of real, living, breathing human beings. Corporations have people working for them, but that's not how they raise their money. I will s send all of this to Denise. I have not yet, um, but I certainly will. Thank you again for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Well, we appreciate all of the information which we have received from you. Um, okay. It's close to 9.30. The time at which we need to be calling that done. So why don't we take care of that? Um, let me ask. I need to make sure. Um, we have one hour left that we can put to this issue this morning. Um, Eleanor, do you have further information for us from the AG's office? I do. It should be fast. It should be. So maybe we'll hear from you before we call that. Okay. And then um, it's quite a few here. on this side of the room, I know, Ben, we have you down on the agenda. So you're wanting to testify. Yeah. Yes. Any anyone else who came? We just listening. I, I emailed, but I don't know for the week. We we do have that on our web page from the week. Okay. Did you receive that from? Uh, from but I was here to to take to testify. Oh, to testify. You want to testify also? Okay. So we'll we need to get Ben in and the lead in. Oh. And would you like to be testifying also? Oh, only if people want to hear about my experience. If we have time. Um, if not today. And um, would you like to be testifying also? Or not? No. Uh, Connor? Do you want to testify? <laughs> okay. Well, we'll see who we can. Oh. And Will, did you have anything else you wanted to say to us at this point? He's here for questions, so if you have any. So, Eleanor Spots from the AG's office, what do you have for us? Yes, um, I just wanted to follow up on a couple of questions that I received last time, which I was unable to answer. Um, I now hopefully have some answers for you. Uh, one of the questions was. Um, uh, how many complaints uh, result in uh, formal enforcement action? Um, I have reviewed our records, and as best I can tell, uh, we have had uh, approximately 10 complaints over the last 10 years that have resulted in any kind of civil penalty. Um, all of those complaints were settled out of court. Uh, six of them were settled out of court before we even got to court. Uh, the remaining four uh, involved some kind of court action prior to settlement. Uh, I do not have um, an exact number of uh, complaints that did not result in those kinds of settlements. Um, we have a better system in place, I believe, for keeping track of those now, including sending them to the Ethics Committee. I can tell you that over uh, the recent town meeting day, we received approximately 10 complaints uh, just related to town meeting day. None of those resulted in any kind of um, civil penalties. From this past town meeting day? Correct. Uh, the other question I had um, was regarding uh, whether I was aware of any kind of enforcement action uh, against corporations specifically. Uh, this is a little bit of a tricky question. I understand the committee has been uh, discussing corporations as sort of separate entities from PACs, um, and that is how we tend to think of them. However, uh, most PACs are incorporated. <laughs> um, and uh, so 
certainly there have been enforcement actions against PACs. Um, I can't tell you which, which of those are incorporated. Uh, we've also had a number of actions um, against associations that um, should register as PACs but are not currently registered as PACs, so that's one of the violations that they failed to register as a PAC. Um, and I would also remind the committee that um, any group of two or more individuals that raises and spends uh, more than $1,000 does need to register as a PAC. So to the extent that we're talking about corporations pouring a lot of money into campaigns, if that money is over $1,000, they already need to register as a PAC. Um, so I would just uh, have the committee keep that in mind. Um, I'm happy to take further questions if there are any. All right, so 10 complaints resulted in some form of enforcement action. Correct. So, and so this takes into account the PACs not registering as PACs? Yes. They would be included in that? Those are included. If uh, The enforcement action, is, as I've interpreted it, um, is anything that results in some payment of some kind of uh, civil penalty. Um, we have had, uh, certainly we follow up on every complaint, so um, we, you know, contact the person who uh, is allegedly in violation, we discuss the violation with them, at times they've, they've cured it without paying a penalty, um, but yes, of the, of the 10 that have resulted in payment of civil penalties, those include um, organizations that should have registered as So tax. given that the 10 is not a large number, can you sort of describe the, the cases, the 10 enforcement actions that have been taken by the Attorney General in 10 years? So I was not here when these no, actions <laughs> occurred, so I have uh, limited information about them. Um, some of them uh, may be much more familiar to uh, the other people in this room than to me, frankly. Um, the committee may be familiar with State versus Green Mountain Future, uh, which is a case in uh, 2013 that went up to the Vermont Supreme Court um, that had an allegation of failure to register as a PAC um, and failure to file the reports that uh, go along with um, uh, PAC's obligations. Um, there was another uh, enforcement action um, titled State versus uh, Brian Duby and Republican Governors Association. Um, I believe that was settled while it was still at the trial court level. Um, and uh, it involved uh, failures to report um, and I believe excessive uh, contributions uh, over the limit. Um, there was a related action, uh, state versus uh, just the Republican Governors Association, um, which involved a failure to register as a PAC, uh, failure to file periodic reports, um, acceptance of contributions uh, in excess of the limits. Um, what was the penalty on that one? Uh, that one uh, settled. For what? That penalty was uh, $40,000. Uh, there is the recent case of State versus Corrin. Um, I assume the mm -hmm. committee is familiar with the, the case against Dean Corrin. Um, that also ultimately settled uh, recently with Corrin um, and prior to that with the Vermont Democratic Party. Uh, the remaining settlements um, happened entirely out of court. I don't believe uh, any of them are confidential, um, but I'm not sure that I want to sit here and recite them all. No, yes? What was the Corn settlement? Uh, the Corn settlement ultimately uh, was uh, Dean Corn paid uh, $255 to charity. Yeah. I mean, just to, to follow up on that, I, I, mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, don't you think there should be public disclosure of these actions? I mean, I believe there is. I, because I mean, I'm a little concerned that you're saying you don't want to talk about half of them uh, in a, a committee where we're trying to figure out what the problem is here. I'm I'm happy to follow up with records. Um, but if I mean, the this committee is would... your second time in here, and now we're going to have a third time in here. Uh, I'm just concerned about the lack of disclosure here. I mean, this is an important issue. I think the attorney general's office would want to be out in front on making sure that the voters of Vermont know who's violating our campaign finance laws. Representative. 
forgive my abundance of caution on this. I am brand new to the office. I was not here when these uh, actions were taken. I believe they are public records, and to the extent that we can provide public records to the committee, I'm happy to do that. Okay. Thank you. I, I would just want to say, to underscore what Eleanor has said, besides the fact that, that you knew, um, the, the cases at the, at the, the statewide level, they, they were covered by the press. It was all over the news throughout the various processes. And um, more local things, since there were some questions raised uh, at various points in South Burlington, as a matter of fact, I know that our local papers covered that nothing was kept under wraps at all. So, um, so any other questions for Eleanor? Thank you very much of for course. coming back to yeah. us. I mean, we'll find you. Yes. Okay, so I guess, well, Lisa, but you know the secret about using this phone, right, Jessica? You know the secrets of the we phone? We need the number. Oh, we need oh, the number. Yes, we need the number, and she's not here. Okay, well, we'll just proceed. Well, we take, take a break. Well, no, because she'll, no, then I'll leave both of them. Okay, so you just stay put right here. Take a little break. Do. How about while we wait for Denise to come back? Um, ben, if you wouldn't mind taking the chair. Sure. Uh, uh, placeholder, uh, pass a little time. <laughs> well, but you're going to speak to us about the, the bill as written, yes? I am. <laughs> Would you identify yourself for the record, please, because it's all recorded. Yes. I'm uh, Ben Cohen. Uh, I'm the ice cream guy. Uh, <laughs> I live in Williston. <laughs> I'm 67. I'm sorry? I'm 67. That's oh, not that's not, you want not old. You want any more? That's not. You want any more identification? <laughs> uh, we don't need to go there. So, what would you like to tell us with regard to S120? Uh, well, first, I'd like to thank you and the committee for the opportunity to be here today. Um, this is an issue that I'm uh, pretty passionate about, uh, and I feel like. I want to express my appreciation for you guys that are uh, serving the state. Uh, you know, I feel like legislators in Vermont are doing a true service. Uh, you don't get paid much for it. Uh, nobody's in it for the money. Uh, and I respect you for it. And, and I feel like you do it because you believe in democracy. And uh, call it quaint, but I do too. Uh, you know, I think we all know what's going on here. Montpelier <coughs> is crawling with corporate lobbyists and corporate money, corporate donations to campaigns. And it happens so much uh, that it becomes normal. And, you know, despite the fact that corporations are not people, uh, they're so oftentimes in this building and they, their face is a person, you start to get the feeling that they're a person, but they're not. So they're not we the people. They're not the people that you all represent. They're not why you ran for office in the first place. I believe you ran to serve the interests of your constituents, the people who elected you. And it's interesting that the people who elected you, uh, people you re represent, are good working people, but they don't have the time uh, to spend here lobbying you, and they don't have much money to give to political campaigns. Uh, they don't get paid to talk to you about their interests. Uh, the only people that get paid to do that, with a few very noble exceptions, there's one right there, <laughs> are those who are doing the bidding of corporations, those who are working in the narrow self-interest of corporations without regard for what's in the best interests of Vermont as a whole. You know, Corporations are willing to spend so much money uh, on lobbyists and on political donations 
because they know that influencing legislation is the best investment they can make. It's the best return on investment that a corporation can make is trying to influence legislation in their favor. And it is solely a profit-driven uh, decision. So, but people tend to equiv equivocate. You know, uh, you have... No, no, please go on. You, ha you have one person uh, telling you one thing, and then you have another person on the opposite side telling you something different. And they're both people. But the difference is that one side represents the narrow self-interest of corporations, and the other represents regular people. And they're not able to make these big donations. You know, I know that people say that uh, you can take somebody's money and not be beholden to them. But it's just human nature. I mean, somebody buys me lunch, and I listen to them. Uh, I think that the basic thing wrong with our democracy is that corporations and the ultra-wealthy have too much power, and everybody knows it. It's what shuts regular people out of the system. And that's why people check out. That's why they don't get involved. That's why they don't vote. Because they know the game is rigged. Democracy, if we are to have a democracy, must be constantly honed and burnished. We must constantly defend it from the assault of big money. I know S120 isn't perfect, but what's the downside? There isn't any. S120 makes the situation better. It does make it harder for corporations to influence legislation. It's a necessary tool to defend our democracy at this time. Anything that we can do to limit the influence of corporations on our political process is a stand in favor of the people of Vermont. Vermont could be leading the way on this issue, but instead, it's in danger of becoming more sucked into the corrupting influence of big money. The best thing we can do to protect our democracy and the interests of real Vermonters, the ones that are actually people, not corporations, is to stamp money out of politics. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Just so you know, my, my hope is to take the questions for Ben, and then we'll hear from Rick, who's I trust still on the phone here, and then we'll deal with Matt Dunn immediately after Rick. Okay. So. Can yes. you do that again? Because I mean, Jim missed it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you can replay it over. There. <laughs> so. so uh, the money that you give to politics, to politicians, and I'm sure it's happened for causes and people over yeah, the years. Yeah. So it's come from you personally or yeah. from Ben and Jerry's? Just me personally. It's just come from you, and you're yeah. limited as to how much you can give because you're, yeah. you're not giving as a corporation. Right. Uh, Gee, I, I thought there was, your you're, you guys' names are out there a lot, so I gathered that there was a lot of corporate money going well, to a well, lot of causes. That's the interesting thing. Ben is a person. Jerry is a person. Ben and Jerry, not a person. You know, Ben and Jerry's corporation is not a person, and therefore, um, there's a big difference between the two. Other questions for Ben? Well, sorry, I missed probably for a fair amount. We were testifying on another bill, but um, one of the, the concerns that came up the other day about this and I'm not talking national election, let's just talk state, is there's a lot of us, and I include myself in that, who are either part of 
a corporation or in some cases a single member LLC. How do you define what's a corporation? In other words, there's a lot of nonprofits out there. I would say VPIRG is probably considered a corporation. So, it's a 1040. Are, are we really limiting ourselves to the point where, even as Vermonters, we can't participate in democracy? I don't think so. Uh, you know, I, I would defer to, to Paul, who probably understands the specifics of this legislation better, but as, as the gentleman here just pointed out, I mean, I, I can make a donation as an individual, uh, but that's very different than making a donation as a corporation. So my understanding is that people would be allowed to donate based on the current donation rules, but corporations would not. Um, if I could, since Betsy, who's our attorney, she had to go to appropriations, the, the woman who was um, But, Will, let me ask, can, can you clarify with regard to Rob's question? Or not? Yes, wait till Betsy yes. no, as I understood it, at uh, least. Will said elections director. Director of elections, for the record. Under this bill, Rob, and uh, Representative LeClaire, and the effects of this bill, the distinction doesn't matter between the various types of corporations because of the way that this uh, legislation is crafted. Which they says- They would all be prohibited. Yes. Yeah. 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 All set? Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Other questions for Ben? Uh, Jim, yes. And I'm sorry I missed the first part of your conversation. <laughs> it was big, really the big reveal <laughs> that they were talking about. <laughs> um, you know, I, I may be one of the few people that remember as I get older that when you first started um, and I don't know if you recall but I was a young store manager at the Hannaford then Martins on Shelton Road. Wow. Um, and I remember. <laughs> so I was delivering yeah, to you. <laughs> I, I remember you coming to the store and you were doing your marketing. Um, you were, well I won't even say marketing, you were testing an idea. You had your ice cream shop. This is before you were packaging. Mm -hmm. um, and you came in and said, look, we're thinking of packaging our ice cream. Do you think, you know, you might, if, would you carry it? Do you think that you want that product? We should be receptive to it. But my question related to that is, at that point in time, I know any funds you probably had were sorely needed in the business and reinvesting. But were you a partnership or a corporation when you had your ice cream shop and before you started packaging? I think we were always a corporation. Okay. Um, I, so let's just presuppose you were a partnership, you and Jerry. Yeah. Um, which, you know, in essence is kind of like a sole proprietor, but just two partners. Mm -hmm. um, would there be any difference of the partnership contributing versus you, separate from Jerry, contributing? Well, my understanding, <clears throat> and you know, I'm no lawyer, <laughs> is that uh, that there would there would be a, a huge difference. Uh, that if I contributed as Ben, that would be an individual contribution. If Ben and Jerry's contributed as a partnership, that would be a business contribution by that partnership. And I'm not sure legally a partnership. Is it a corporation? It's, well, it's not necessarily a corporation. Partnership. Well, perhaps, uh, okay, Will, so maybe. can you clarify on this one, or is it a Betsy question? This question was, is there a distinction between a partnership and a corporation for this purpose? No. Okay. So a partnership would be a corporation? No. It doesn't matter. The way this bill is phrased talks about who can contribute to the various entities. And it says only individuals, tax, and parties, I believe I don't have it right in front of me, can contribute. There's no other type of entity which would exclude all of them. Okay. What have been talked about? Okay. Partnership, LLC, nonprofit, for profit. Because again, it talks about who can contribute, not who can't. 
and then identifies individuals, packs, yeah. and parties as the entities that can't be true. Okay, thank you. That's yeah. helpful. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me, Jim. You're, well, you're I, coming I, back I, to me no, now. No, no. You've, I, you've I, aged I, a little. I, I, I've aged a lot. Uh, uh, I, I could tell you a few other stories. Uh, uh, well, but Jim, I'll be I, 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 Dennis's role for the history lessons, and I won't. Uh, I won't go there. Um, can I? Can I do one? Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> schedule at this point. Okay. So I make won't. it really quick, and then Dennis and then Rick, we need to hear from you on the phone. Very little quick about this. Jim, come on. Okay, Please. so um, I don't know if you remember my role with the Grocers Association. I remember. Uh, my very first convention that year at the Rad Old Radisson, um, I remember we had a comedian from Maine come for the dinner speaking. At the same night, we were uh, honoring you and Jerry uh, for the work you were doing um, for the public uh, public service. And uh, I remember the comedian coming and saying, I'm supposed to be at this table with Ben and Jerry. Who the heck are those guys? <laughs> uh, so um, anyhow, you, your name recognition has grown. Over has increased, years. right? <laughs> About six or seven years ago, uh, I told somebody that I enjoyed uh, Ben and Jerry's vanilla, and they say, out of all the flavors, why would you bother with vanilla? Well, because I had discovered that when that maple sapling liqueur came out the first year, <laughs> you put that on Ben and Jerry's vanilla, and it's really good, and I've shared it with knowledge of my committee a couple times, but it is excellent, and I suggest it. It's Vermont maple sapling liqueur. It's made in the state, and Ben and I, Jerry's vanilla. I have some in my closet, but it never had occurred to me to combine the two. So thank oh, you, Lord. I thought you'd thank be you. doing it all. <laughs> thank, thank you for the tip. And by the way, you know, my mother always told me not to eat ice cream before breakfast, so I did not provide. But should I have the opportunity to testify at the committee sometime after lunch, I'd be happy to provide refreshments because you can't get by on. Kirkland peanut butter pretzels. <laughs> so we'll oh, oh, I don't know that it would be appropriate for us to accept oh, right. such um, <laughs> But thank you for the well, well, maybe, maybe, I, maybe I could give it to a pack first and then the pack again. Exactly. <laughs> so thank you very much. All right, much. thank you very much. You did a motorcycle um, trip Rick, with Dan Cox yeah, yeah. to Savannah, I'm Georgia, a few yeah. years ago when you yeah. went to the shop down, the Ben and Jerry Rick, shop. Yeah. That was my daughter that worked in the shop. Ah, that's you, amazing. That's great. That's great. Right. Who yeah. has made contact through Paul Burns that he's waiting wherever he is to hear from us? Okay. So our apologies for being behind schedule, but it's how it's what happens. So Rick, okay. for the for the record now, um, as a witness, if you would identify yourself and then tell us what you need to tell us. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rick Hubbard, and I'm a South Burlington, Vermont resident, a retired attorney, a former economic consultant, a writer on democracy reform, and a contributor to. Deeper. My position on S120 is somewhat different than that of Deeper and our Vermont Secretary of State. I believe S120 is of little use if it can be easily circumvented, especially by those who wish to use contributions way in excess of Vermont norms to vote out those legislators standing up for our broad public interest and vote in those who will support their narrower private interests. So the thrust of my testimony today is to encourage you to find a way to pass legislation that will actually be effective in protecting Vermont citizens and members of our legislature from the undue influence of outside Vermont advocacy groups that wish to use their financial leverage to influence law, regulation, and policy to serve their narrower vested interest over the common broad interest of all Vermont. And I recently met with our Vermont Secretary of State, Jim Condo, and I asked him, Jim, what safeguards currently prevent an outside of Vermont 501c4 or equivalent single issue organization 
from spending massively more than normal in quotes Vermont House or Senate races in order to tip the balance in our legislature more in favor of their issue. And as an example, so. uh, a group promoting school choice and vouchers, for example. His response, absolutely nothing. Now here's a real world example of this from Wisconsin. In Vermont, our House of Representative District, we have 150, are roughly equivalent to in Wisconsin, their lower house assembly district. They have 99. Campaign contributions and expenditures on average for Wisconsin assembly district races and their larger districts in Vermont, normally averaging the 20 to 30 thousand dollars. Remember that figure. In 2014, first time Republican candidate Todd Novak won the race in Wisconsin Assembly District 51 by just 59 votes against first time Democrat Richard or Dick Case. Novak raised $133,000, coming back to that 20 to 30,000 normal range, of which the American Federation for Children, a Washington, D.C.-based 501c4 nonprofit school choice advocacy group that's funded, I might add, by Betsy DeVos and others, spent, of that $133,000, that group spent 123000 of it, 92-plus percent, to help elect Novak. Though officially not a lot to coordinate, that group effectively ran Novak's campaign, produced and paid for the advertisements, picked the issues they focused on. Novak did almost nothing. Despite its goal, and I'm talking about the goal of this organization, to tip the balance in the Wisconsin legislature more toward support for school choice, and I might add they won six of the eight races they targeted this way. The American Federation for Children almost never ran ads supporting school choice. For example, it went after Dick Tate for his vote on a local school board concerning the Pledge of Allegiance. But what to prevent this from happening in Vermont? In my opinion, to prevent this effectively, you must go beyond the influence of corporate money and instead address the underlying structural campaign financing in ballot that can bias who gets to be elected and re-elected and that can also potentially influence outcomes of law, regulation, and policy here in Vermont as well as in other states. Currently, less than 2% of the Vermont voter age population donates any money at all the Vermont state legislators and gubernatorial elections. The actual figure in 2014 was only 1.79%. That means more than 98% of us, all Vermonters, give nothing. And this campaign funding imbalance is an important part of the huge problem that we American citizens face today. We declared our independence from Great Britain largely over the issue of improper representation. And we established our U.S. Constitution in 1787 to, in the words of James Madison, be independent from outside special interest pressure in order to serve the public good. Yet much evidence today documents that nationally, we citizens largely elect good people to represent us in Washington, who are then incentivized to often act in ways that place their own re-election interests those of their wealthy and influential campaign funders and those of their political party above the common broad interests of the American people. For decades, Congress has resisting, resisted passing broad and comprehensive measures to reform the structure and financing of our political process. Consequently, our republic and its system of representative democracy are at great risk today. In recent, in recent years, we have disbanded many of the historical norms of bipartisanship, respect for the views of opponents, and support for public institutions that have helped our system of government work effectively. And our founding fathers anticipated 
that in the future we might come to the state where we are today. And they, in our Constitution, in Article 5, place the responsibility for initiating the needed reforms directly with we citizens through you, our state legislators, in the event of inaction by Congress. And in addressing the issue of corporate contributions, I urge you to take this responsibility seriously. Our country is in trouble and on a very bad path. And I ask you to do what is necessary to broadly strengthen the financing and structure of our political processes, both with respect to corporate contributions, but more broadly than that, in order to effectively protect our broad public interest. You must be the adults in the room, and I wish you a lot of success. In the words of our former Vermont governor, Phil Ha, this issue is likely the most important public policy issue of our time, for it goes to the very core of our democracy and representation. And that's it. Uh, thank you, Rick. Are you open to some questions? Of course. Okay. Any questions from committee for Rick? Uh, Marsha from Richmond. Hi, Rick. Um, because you're an attorney and obviously very interested in this issue, can you make specific, uh, more specific suggestions on how uh, campaign finance legislation could be made tighter, uh, more effective? Yes, but it's hard to do it within the context of just the uh, F-120 legislation that you have in front of you. In order to make this difference, we have to change the incentives that those of you who are elected have based on where you get the money to get you reelected from. And I'm the first to admit that in Vermont we do a much better job than we're doing national. It's pretty easy to make these arguments national. Uh, but when we elect, continue to fund our system, where 98% of all Vermonters do not give a dime, even under the old ways, the 2% we're giving money does have an effect on who legislators pay attention to, whose phone calls get elected, get returned first. And it does have an effect on uh, how legislators pay attention to issues. Ask yourself, for example, in terms of the person who has raised uh, questions about the importance of this uh, If a citizen knows that legislator X received, say Novak in uh, Wisconsin, received 92% of his money from one 501c4 pack that focuses on school choice, is that going to be really important? Or isn't the real issue, who does Representative Novak pay attention to? And whose phone call does Representative Novak uh, return in regard to the fact that he was basically elected by this organization? So I'm not quite as willing to uh, accept that disclosure alone solves the problem very much. It has, it has to focus on raising the money broadly enough across all Vermonters so that the influence and impact of money coming from a few is diluted. And there are schemes out there to do that. Lawrence Lessig has proposed one using vouchers, for example, and that moves very much in that direction. Okay. Marsha? Thank you. Uh, John? Uh, could you explain a little more about the vouchers? Sure. Uh, uh, the, the numbers will be a little arbitrary. That's all right. I'll use national numbers for a minute. But if you take the total amount of money spent over a two-year period nationally to influence or to fund our entire federal campaign process, it's about $6.5 billion dollars over two years in the political cycle, annualize it to half, three and a quarter billion. And now divide that by the number of registered voters. The amount of money is remarkably small. 
it's about $23 per registered voter. Uh, so if you finance with a voucher system, uh, a good chunk of our federal election process uh, by allowing every registered voter to have control over a voucher that they could use to allocate from. It could be $50. It could be less than that. Uh, they could allocate this voucher only to candidates in small amounts whose positions on issues uh, were of interest and importance to the voter allocating. Now, instead of 2% or less of all uh, registered voters influencing the political process as to who gets elected. Now, if you're a candidate, you have to speak to the interest much more broadly of close to 100% of all. Instead of getting through a an election in the Republican or the Democratic primary, where we have 5 or 10% typically that might uh, participate of all the registered voters, and those people select the candidates that in the general election we have, we, the rest of us, have to choose among. Uh, now, in some states where it's been changed, you have to speak to the interests of all 100% because they're all funding you. And in California, they've even changed the primary process to have a single uh, nonpartisan blanket primary. And all 100% of Californians get the vote. Uh, so they broaden the whole incentive that candidates have as to who they have to pay attention to and whose views they have to please in order to get elected. Anything we can do to broaden to a much greater extent the effectiveness and interest of all 100% of citizens for moving that direction is very, very helpful. And a voucher system could be an important point of that. Part of it. Okay, John? Yep, I'm fine, thank you. And Warren. Hi, Rick, it's Warren. Um, Hi, Warren. One concern with the vouchers, though, is wouldn't that just shift where corporations spent their money? Wouldn't the corporations spend a lot of money trying to influence to whom individuals gave those vouchers? Uh, sure. I think it's fair to assume they do their very best to do that. Yeah, so uh, the question is, do they have more influence that way than they have today? Yeah. Well, it's one of the reasons why I'm glad we're not a, a state that has ballot initiatives that are binding, uh, <laughs> because they spend massive amounts on 30-second sound bites to vote no on this or vote yes on that. And I, I would think that the the voucher thing would end up in about the same place. <laughs> anyway, uh, but anyway, maybe, I, I think it would be an improvement, so. Maybe, Warren, but remember that but for uh, the ability of citizens to uh, petition to put something on the ballot, despite the fact that it can be misused and uh, played with, uh, without that, uh, California would not have improved its redistricting and put citizens in the middle of it because it was being misused by both political parties or the one in control. And without it, they wouldn't have moved to, uh, to change the way they do their primary balloting system uh, in order to make uh, it available for participation for more and more Americans. There's a flip side to it, and uh, that's all I'm pointing out. Yeah. No, thank you, Rick. Okay. Thank, thank you, Rick. Um, we're going to have to um, hang up with you and try and get through to Matt Dunn. Hopefully, he's still available to the committee. Fair enough. I don't know. Thank you, everybody. And, and Rick, and Matt, do you want me to call you on my cell phone so you can listen to Matt's testimony? I would if you can. Okay. Thank you. Jim, Jim, did you bring cake or anything? There's cake in here. Where? For you. Oh, for his birthday. <laughs> are you trying to steal my birthday? No. Oh, that's right. You Hello. Here. You weren't here when it Hello, Matt. Yes, that's a 
Yeah. Matt, uh, it's Maida Townsend it's calling on Maida behalf Maida. of the House Government Operations Committee in Montpelier. Oh, no. I, I know we're late in calling you. Do you have um, sure. Do you have time to talk with us now? I do. Oh, fabulous. Fabulous. Okay. So if you would please, um, the committee is gathered here as well as a room full of folks interested in hearing what you have to say with regard to S. 120 as passed over to us from the Senate. Sure. Uh, Representative, thank you for including me and accommodating uh, my need to be in Southern Vermont today. Uh, so I, I have uh, long been a passionate uh, believer that we need to do something about uh, campaign finances in both our state and country. I was involved in the campaign finance reform effort in uh, the 90s that Vermont put out there and unfortunately the Supreme Court didn't agree with. Uh, and I'm delighted that the Senate was willing to move forward with at least uh, the small step of banning corporate contributions in Vermont. Uh, because this to me is the most basic first step uh, that we need to take. And I would say it's for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is on the pure optics. Uh, I think Vermonters have said loud and clear that despite the Supreme Court, uh, corporations are not people, and we should not be allowing them to engage in our election process as if they were. Uh, and there are uh, 22 other states, uh, as well as the feds, who have decided to ban corporate contributions, uh, and I believe it makes uh, sense for uh, Vermont to do the same, to reflect that view that we want people participating in our democracy, uh, not corporate interests, uh, and that we should be uh, you know, following uh, that direction. Uh, the other is that uh, the corporate contribution uh, loophole is really the dumbest one in our state law. Uh, under the current uh, setup, uh, a person with uh, significant resources uh, typically has multiple LLCs for a variety of different reasons, whether they are uh, uh, for real estate holdings or small uh, companies that they have put together, uh, where they are the sole member of that LLC. And under the current law, uh, it allows for that individual to not only give the maximum amount to a candidate uh, from their own personal checking account, uh, but to give that same amount to each one of their LLC, uh, effectively multiplying at a significant level uh, the financial uh, contribution and influence uh, of that individual through those multiple LLCs. Uh, this is just something that is, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 if you look at it kind of laughable on its face in the way that it can flout the uh, intention of the law and by, uh, by banning uh, corporate contributions, uh, you remove uh, that uh, egregious uh, loophole. So those would be the, the, the two big uh, you know, reasons that I would strongly encourage the committee to uh, support this legislation, join the 22 other states and the federal government uh, in banning corporate contributions. We've seen some uh, you know, press uh, in, in the last year that have actually questioned the motivation of uh, people in elective office uh, to support certain initiatives. Uh, based on direct corporate contributions to their campaign. And that's very different from individuals, even from those same companies, giving to a, a candidate, um, because it's about those individuals' view, not the view of the corporation as an entity. Uh, I don't think that's healthy for our discourse in Vermont. I don't think it's healthy for democracy. And there's a real opportunity for uh, the legislature to take action. Are you up for some questions? Absolutely. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, first one is from Jim Harrison from Chittenden. Chittenden. Hey, Jim. The town of hey, Chittenden. Matt, how are you? Fine. Good to hear from you. Listen, um, I'm trying to wrestle with, um, you know, the differences here, but um, 
You know, you, you recently have been involved in a statewide uh, campaign and obviously know the importance of raising money to get your message out. And irregardless of where the money comes from, whether it's individuals or corporate, um, you have to, I mean, you're putting your stamp of approval, you control the message that comes out from your campaign as to what you stand for, um, what you say about your opponent, um, etc. Um, but, you know, I, at the same time, we have these independent um, expenditures, um, which you don't control uh, and may give potentially misleading information and I'm wondering what's what's worse um, I mean I think you were uh, you had a, a, a friend or former friend uh, that perhaps gave a, a lot of personal money uh, not outside of any limitations as to you know what you someone could give to your campaign um, and you have no control over that and it may help you or may hurt you or maybe misleading to the public um, so I'm trying to trying to wrestle. What are we just creating more of that going forward? So what you highlight is the overall problem with our current campaign finance system. One that uh, you know many of us uh, tried to address as Vermont tried to lead the rest of the country in the '90s on actually putting the kibosh on that kind of over-the-top excessive spending uh, on campaigns, including, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, independent expenditures that we're seeing, you know, across the state of Vermont and across the country. Uh, and unfortunately, we have a Supreme Court uh, that has ruled under its current configuration uh, that those kinds of seemingly reasonable limits uh, are unconstitutional. And we are left with having to work within them what I, uh, that should not, however, uh, stop the legislature from doing the uh, right thing in making sure that uh, individuals are the ones who are contributing uh, to candidate, uh, to, to candidates' uh, uh, campaign coffers, uh, not corporations, um, because it's just a, a fundamentally different entity uh, when you are contributing from a corporation uh, than when you are uh, you're contributing as an individual. Uh, and when you start having people contributing through uh, LLCs with uh, random and innocuous names that are associated with real estate holdings or other kinds of things, uh, it, it just obscures things. So I don't think this is going to uh, affect the problem with uh, independent expenditures or other uh, problems with our finance system. Uh, you know, one way or the other, uh, what I do know is that it will be a step in the right direction for limiting direct corporate contributions and, and the, uh, both the optics and the practical uh, loophole uh, that's associated with that piece of law. Warren? Good morning, man. It's Warren Kitzmiller. Um, Good morning. Good morning. Uh, a little while earlier, with a different witness, I, I was. I want to go back to the idea of a, a person who incorporates any number of LLCs, of which are really the only member. Um, and my question would be, how hard would it be for each of them to establish a PAC? And how much? I don't know anything about how much effort it takes to establish a PAC, uh, but but I wonder if that wouldn't be even with even with a proposed new one, if that would be an easy way to circumvent these limits because they can, they can accept contributions from PACs with certain limits on it, but if you, if you can establish essentially an unlimited number of PACs, you could really get around it. So how hard is it to set up a, a PAC? So what you're talking about, though, is still having to make someone go through a process of establishing PACs to be able to push money through, and those PACs need to uh, report on who's contributing to them. Uh, and as I understand it, uh, corporations, at least, certainly at the federal level, and I believe this would be true at the state level, 
uh, are not allowed to directly give to a, a, a PAC either. Um, so it would eliminate the ability of a you know, large company just giving directly to a PAC to funnel money around. Uh, but it also means that if someone was wanting to set up uh, a bunch of entities to be able to, to, to you know, funnel their money through to contribute over and over again, uh, they would have to take those steps. Whereas right now, uh, you know, many uh, high net worth individuals already have, in fact, even, even people who aren't high net worth individuals, uh, for a variety of reasons, have multiple LLCs. And without having to go through any rigmarole of setting up a pack and having to file it and having to do the, the filing associated with it in the you know on an annual basis and the rest would have to it, they would be able to just write checks out of those other LLC bank accounts that already exist. Anything we can do to create a barrier to that kind of uh, process and more transparency on who is the participant in those uh, uh, money donating entities uh, is a step forward. So even though it would be possible, it still is a barrier, even though it's permeable to a certain extent. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Matt. Yep. Anybody else from the committee? Uh, Matt, any final words for the good of the order? No, uh, just in a busy, busy session, I, I'm delighted that you all are, are taking up this important issue. I think it will send a, a clear message uh, and have a uh, practical, real uh, benefit for democracy in the state. So um, thank you for, for hearing me out and uh, happy, to, happy to answer questions later if people have, have questions. Terrific, and we've got your number now, so <laughs> we're, and we're, not, we're not shy. So thank you very much for being patient and, and waiting for us to, to get a hold of you. Much appreciated. I, I, I understand the legislative time. Not a problem at all. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Now, folks, we have the League of Women Voters who, have, who need to be heard from here. Connor, you're in the building. So, yeah. so I will be quick. My name is Dottie Ricks. I'm a member of the League of Women Voters. I'm uniquely qualified to be here testifying on this bill because I'm one of a handful of League of Women Voters who have actually run for office. So I know that you're directly affected by this bill, but I'm that little person that is really affected by that bill. I'm a political novice. I ran. I had uh, no uh, political party financing. I ran against uh, incumbents that had a Republican war chest. And um, I can tell you that if I had thought Rob was supported by some big multinational corporation, I would not have run. Because I looked at what it cost. The statistics said approximately $5,000. Well, I'm a retired school teacher. I can afford $5,000 from my savings, and I might even be able to knock them off. I might be able to bring an independent view, uh, a different view uh, to uh, Vermont politics. So that's the reason I ran. So when this bill is a positive bill, it says who can donate. And you know, if we're talking about Goliath, I don't believe that there is a David. I believe with a Goliath, you, you take them off one limb at a time. I don't think you get one lucky shot and knock them down. So I don't believe that limiting uh, influence from large corporations is ever going to be, is ever going to happen in one fell swoop. So this bill, to me, is the first step to making uh, to allowing people like me to be encouraged to participate in the political process. And Vermont is unique where a an, an, uh, political novice and someone unheard of can come and do that. I do want to reiterate uh, what the League of Women uh, voters, their position. I do have a full position that I can email to you. Um, this is from uh, Kate Rader who uh, is uh, a member of our board. So what we want to do and what we have done for almost 100 years is enhance political equality by limiting the uh, uh, financial influence of whomever, 
we are enhancing political equality. Uh, we want to ensure maximum participation. I've already told you. If I had thought Ron, uh, Rob had this huge amount of money, why would I waste $5,000? You know, as it was, I felt like I learned a lot and I got a good um, um, understanding of what it takes. And we, we want to enable candidates to compete equitably. So, um, of course, we uh, for years have supported public funding. We have supported um, taking out corpor corporate and PAC um, investments in um, uh, elections and so we hope that you will advance this bill again we're not trying to get rid of Goliath in one fell swoop this is one act that will begin hopefully the dismantling of finance um, influence uh, we hope that you will pass it to the house and we hope that um, you will enable Vermont to, in, uh, to join the 22 states who already have such laws. Thank you. Thank you. One, one sec, there's a question. Oh. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> I was hoping. Get, I've been here. <laughs> I was hoping really we could escape to get out that. <laughs> so. No. Really, I thought Rob was going to nail me, so. <laughs> I'll, I'll protect you. <laughs> Jen, what would you ask for? Sure. Um, so, uh, I, I come from a rural district, and I don't have any, today, corporate contributions. Um, but we're going to get into a campaign season. From your perspective, I have small businesses in my district. What's the difference between a country store that maybe knew me from my prior life that wants to give me $100 versus them doing it personally. I mean, what 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 would the difference be on me as their <clears throat> representative? The way I would look at it, yeah. if a person donates to me, that is that person, and I have a relationship with that person, and and um, it, it makes it more I don't know real. Um, if it's a business, what is that? You know, it, it's this um, amorphous thing that um, you know that I can't talk to and I can't relate to and um, uh, so you know to be honest with you I believe in public financing and I believe that if people financed their own elections runs like I did you would have more responsible people and you would limit the amount of money that goes into elections. It's ridiculous the amount of money that goes into getting people elected when our infrastructure is down, our schools, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, you know, am I opposed to a small business um, donating money, a local, it's local, it's personal, it's not some big corporation from outside that wants to come in and tell us how to vote and take over our politics. Yeah, no, I, 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 I hear you. I'm just trying to differentiate between Jim's Country Store and Jim. I mean, they're synonymous uh, in, in, in probably many people's eyes. So um, I, I don't disagree with you in terms of, in an ideal world, we would go to, like they did 100 years ago, go and have a debate, talk about the issues, and then we uh, go home and vote. Um, that's not the world we live in today. But in Vermont, we come closer to it than anywhere else. Thank you. Uh, Donnie? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. The much-mentioned Rob. <laughs> you should have been here yesterday. <laughs> there was a lot of Robs in the room. Just for the record, Donnie ran a very well-run campaign. I had so much fun. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is that it? No. Let me ask. Let me find out. Uh, are there any other questions from the committee? No, we're good. Okay. Thank you so much. And um, uh, Connor, another time. And I gather also that uh, Senator Sanders, as in Bernie, has an interest in talking with us over the phone. I or what? question came from me. I see. It did not come from him. Okay.
the question is, would the committee be interested in me finding out if you would be willing to call in and testify? I didn't know if this was the last day we were taking testimony on this bill. Uh, somehow I doubt it. <laughs> I mean, because we have a lot of ground to, to cover, uh, but within a time, time frame, certainly. Uh, committee, what, what is your preference? Would you like uh, Martha to see if at, at some point in, in the near future, um, the senator was available to talk to us via phone or not? It's up to the committee. Okay, no interest plus yes, yes interest. You know, I, I would just say, I know, and I've reached out to 